Hi everyone, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. On March 1st, 2022, at the age of 77, Roger Kemp passed away in his home in Livewood. He was the best husband and father who cared for his family until the very last minute. However, a single memory from 20 years ago haunted Roger until his death as it had completely changed his life. For two long years, he was forced to become a meticulous investigator to find the person responsible for his only daughter's untimely demise. If not for Roger's involvement, the case might have remained unsolved as the police were nearly powerless, but beyond the police, there was Roger, who could not allow the criminal to go unpunished. Let's return to the past and see what happened on that tragic day. Let's begin. Our story took place in the small suburb of Livewood, Kansas, a very small and safe town in the state. Here, all the neighbors know each other by name and wish you a good day upon meeting. The morning of June 18, 2002, started as usual for 19-year-old Alexandra Kemp. Her father had gone to work, her younger brother was still in bed, and her mother was making a delicious breakfast. Alexandra didn't finish her coffee because she was in a hurry to get to work. Allie, as her loved ones affectionately called her, had just finished her first year of college and returned to her hometown for the summer holidays. She got a job as a lifeguard at an outdoor public pool, where her boyfriend and brother were already working. That day, there were almost no visitors, and Allie calmly inspected the area and cleaned the auxiliary premises. Allie entered the pump room and turned around when an unfamiliar voice greeted her. She politely asked him to leave the restricted area and pointed to the door, but he attacked her and started tearing at her clothes. Allie hit him in the face, but he was much stronger. She tried to scream, but he covered her mouth with his hand, and the noise from the operating pumps left no chance to be heard. The next moment, Allie lost consciousness. Sometime later, her brother Tyler came to the pool to take over her shift. He saw her personal belongings on a table, but could not find her anywhere. He searched all around, calling her by name, but Ali did not respond. In a panic, the young man called their father. Roger dropped everything and rushed to the pool. Together with Tyler, they carefully inspected the surrounding area, and to his relief, Roger found that Ali was not in the pool. Upon entering the pump room, Roger saw a large piece of tarpaulin. Shining a flashlight in the dim room, he noticed a pool of blood on the floor, and then a foot sticking out from under the tarp. The father threw off the tarp and cried out at the sight. He fell to his knees, trying to bring her to her senses, but she was unresponsive. At 5.29 p.m., Roger Kemp called the emergency services to report that his daughter had been fatally injured. Throughout the call, the father tried to revive his daughter. He tenderly covered her with his jacket, but blood continued to seep from the inflicted wounds. Roger talked to her and pleadingly asked her not to leave, but the girl was unconscious. The victim was urgently taken to the hospital, where the death of 19-year-old Allie Kemp was confirmed. I hoped she was still conscious and could hear me, but she never came back, Roger said shortly after arriving at the local hospital. Alexandra Elizabeth Kemp suffered multiple head injuries from blunt force trauma, with a pool of blood nearby. Her shirt was torn, she was without pants and underwear, and there were signs of strangulation on her neck. Several of her fingers were broken, and her nails were torn off, suggesting that she had been brutally assaulted before being deprived of life. The pump room, where Allie's body was found, was in disarray, with items strewn about chaotically. It became clear that there had been a fierce struggle between Ali and her assailant, in which she did not give up, but he proved to be stronger. After her life was declared ended, the victim's body was sent for forensic examination, and the crime scene was thoroughly inspected. Unfortunately, the weapon used in the crime was not found either in the pump room or on the pool premises. However, a blood-stained tube of ointment, usually kept in the first aid kit, was found at the crime scene, which investigators found peculiar. They needed to determine why it was found near the victim's body. The ointment tube and its cap were collected for analysis. Police Chief Craig Hill, who inspected the crime scene, expressed his condolences to the parents of the deceased Allie Kemp, 
and stated that in his 35 years of service, this was probably the most horrific crime that could occur in the Livewood community. This crime shocked the quiet town and left too many questions, both for the public and for the investigators. The investigation was puzzled, as one of the main questions in the crime against the young woman was the motive. The first suspected motive was robbery, but her purse and all its contents were untouched, which completely ruled out this theory. The second suspected motive was an assault, but after receiving the forensic examination report, it was established that Ali had not been subjected to intimate violence. The lack of either of these two motives, and indeed any motive at all, made the crime mysterious and strange even to experienced investigators. So who needed to end the life of a young woman whose life had just begun in such a brutal way? Alexandra Elizabeth Kemp was born on October 11, 1982, in the city of Livewood. She was the long-awaited first child in the Kemp family and their only daughter. Ali grew up in a loving home with her parents and two brothers in the idyllic, tree-lined suburb of Livewood. She graduated from high school with honors, loved soccer and poetry, and was voted the most beautiful girl in eighth grade. Following her dreams, Ali enrolled at Kansas State University. In 2002, she had just completed her first year at university and returned to her hometown of Livewood, where her family and boyfriend awaited her. She took a job as part of the service staff at the local pool, just four blocks from her family's home. It was a wonderful job at a nearby pool where her brother and boyfriend were already working. Thus, Ali was a young, promising woman who grew up surrounded by love and care and who certainly could not have had any enemies. Investigators continued to explore various theories about the assault and interviewed friends and acquaintances of Ali to get a more complete picture of the day of the crime. One of the first suspects was Ali's boyfriend. Phil House had known Ali since school, and by 2002, they had been a couple for over five years. It seemed Phil had no reason to harm Ali, but the police had to consider him a suspect. During questioning, Phil explained that Ali had replaced him at the pool at 2 p.m., after which he went to another job. He was there until 4 p.m., then he was at a friend's house playing video games until he received a call about Ali being in the hospital. Phil's alibi was confirmed by colleagues and friends he had been playing games with. However, the police did obtain crucial information from him. It turned out that Ali had called him at 2.52 p.m., but Phil couldn't answer. When he called her back at 3.44 p.m., she did not pick up the phone, which led investigators to suspect that Ali met her tragic fate during this time frame. Despite the desire to solve the case quickly, this clue did not bring the police any closer to finding the criminal. There was hope in the testimony of potential witnesses, as there should have been plenty on a summer day at a public pool. However, due to unfortunate weather conditions, the pool was almost empty that day. The search for any clues or testimonies was progressing very slowly. A few days later, after re-interviewing the pool staff and the surrounding areas, it was established that on the day of the crime, two employees from a lawn service company were working in the parking lot. They were brought in for questioning, where they described noticing a car driving around the parking lot in circles around 2.40 p.m., occasionally leaving but then returning. They were able to provide a clear description of the suspicious vehicle, a beige 1980 Ford pickup. Although the police did not have the vehicle's license number, they now had a piece of important information. However, even more valuable information came from one of Ali's friends. The testimony of Ali's friend, Laurel Wynn, helped provide a description of the suspected criminal. It turned out that around 3 p.m. that day, Ali called her friend Laurel and asked her to keep her company during her shift at the pool as the day was cloudy and not very warm, so there were hardly any visitors. Laurel agreed, and after a while her car pulled into the pool parking lot. She called Ali, but there was no answer. Not seeing Ali outside, Laurel blew loudly on a lifeguard whistle, thinking it would be amusing. At that moment, a man exited the pump room, pretending to talk on the phone. Laurel thought he might be Allie's boss, so she quickly left the pool to avoid causing her friend any trouble. As she left the pool area, the man turned around and waved at Laurel, allowing her to remember his face. 
Laurel did not wait for a call from her friend and left. Assuming she had seen the criminal, the police created and published a composite sketch based on Laurel's description, hoping it would lead them to the criminal. Thus, a very accurate sketch of the presumed criminal was made. The sketch and the description of the suspicious vehicle were broadcasted on local television. Undoubtedly, such publicity increased the chances of identifying and capturing the criminal, and the police indeed received a massive number of reports from people who believed they had seen this man. This led the investigation to its first suspect, James Dryder. A young man, Dryder owned an old Ford pickup and closely resembled the composite sketch. He lived in Olada, approximately 20 minutes' drive from Livewood, where he worked as a mechanic in a small auto repair shop. Upon obtaining the address of the presumed suspect, police visited him at his workplace. However, James vehemently denied any involvement in the assault, and he had an alibi since he was at work all day. His boss confirmed that he was indeed at the auto shop on June 18th. Thus, despite a striking resemblance to the composite, James Dryder was excluded from the list of suspects. The search continued. Months passed and the trail began to cool, but Roger never gave up. While detectives worked on every lead, he pursued new ones. Roger relentlessly conducted his own investigations. He regularly visited the police station, offering various ideas for capturing the criminal. Roger's unyielding efforts led him to appear on America's Most Wanted, where, in addition to sharing Ali's story, the composite sketch of the presumed suspect was shown. The popular show was broadcast not only on local television, but also nationally. A new wave of messages flooded into police stations. Each message was meticulously processed, but for various reasons, each newly emerged suspect was almost immediately ruled out. Ali's boyfriend of five years, Phil House, also assisted. He initiated a virtual hunt sending out emails to university students. He urged them to look at the composite sketch and watch the America's Most Wanted episode focusing on Ali's case. A reward of $50,000 was offered for any information leading to an arrest. Despite all efforts, the case again reached a dead end. However, six months after Ali's murder, detectives received new information about the previously familiar James Dryder. It turned out that in January 2003, news outlets in neighboring Colorado reported the search for a man responsible for three assaults. Roger recognized Dreider from the wanted sketch, who had been previously excluded as a suspect in Ali's murder and was now wanted for assaults. Despite Dreider's alibi on the day of Ali Kemp's murder, the police now had no doubts they had found their suspect. But first, they needed to prove James's involvement. The man had no prior convictions, so he wasn't in the database, and investigators couldn't compare DNA. They needed to check this individual again and obtain his DNA to compare it with the DNA found at the crime scene. By this point, James Dryder was on the run, making him very difficult to locate. It took the police three weeks to find him. At a gas station in Utah, Dryder failed to pay for his fuel, and the staff detained him, calling the police. James Dreider faced charges for three assaults and possibly also for the murder of Ali Kemp. When police compared his DNA sample with the sample from the crime scene, they were disappointed to find no matches. James Dreider was a serial offender, but he did not end Ali Kemp's life. This was a major setback as the investigation had come incredibly close to apprehending the suspect, only for detectives to have to start over from scratch. Days turned into weeks and weeks into months, with the police still having no new suspects in Ali Kemp's case. Two years passed, and the police's interest in the case gradually waned, but not Ali's father, Roger. He did everything within his power to find his daughter's assailant, though his options were limited. He periodically contacted USA Today, which published the composite sketch of the presumed suspect. Roger desperately searched for a broad-faced, somewhat bald man, he posted wanted notices throughout the city. His goal as a devoted father was not only to find the criminal, but also to keep his daughter's story alive in the public consciousness. Then, one day, Roger had a simple and brilliant idea. At the city's entrance, he saw a billboard. It occurred to him that hundreds, even thousands of people saw this billboard daily. Why not place the composite sketch on it? 
he contacted an advertising company to rent the billboard. When the company's management learned about Mr. Kemp's story, they offered not just one, but eight billboards along highways near Livewood for the poster, free of charge. The estimated total daily viewership of these billboards was about 10,000, and Roger's efforts finally began to bear fruit. Two years after Ali Kemp's murder, police started receiving reports of people resembling the sketch. The billboard, along with a higher reward and television advertisements, led to a flurry of tips, including one about a young man named Benjamin Appleby. This individual lived in Bantam, Connecticut, where he was known as Ted Hoover. The 29-year-old man lived under the pseudonym Hoover to avoid prosecution for an intimate offense from 1997. He owned a Ford pickup of the same beige color as the vehicle the suspect was believed to drive. It later turned out that Ted Hoover worked in pool maintenance in 2002, specifically at the pool where Ali was murdered. Armed with this information, police went to question Ted Hoover at his home. During the conversation, he behaved uncertainly and was visibly nervous. At the end of the discussion, Ted was asked to provide a DNA sample to clear himself from the list of suspects. He was clearly unprepared for this request and tried to evade it by making excuses. Initially, he asked to postpone providing samples until he could speak with his lawyer and requested some time to think. The next day, the detective contacted Ted Hoover's lawyer, who informed him that Ted did not want his DNA entered into the national database and thus was opposed to voluntarily providing a DNA sample to the police. Detectives attempted to press the lawyer to provide a letter of assurance that the DNA would not be entered into any database and would only be used within the scope of Ali Kemp's case materials. The lawyer requested a pause to relay this information to his client. However, two days later, the lawyer responded that his client was still against providing his DNA to the police. The detectives were convinced that this individual had something to hide. They remembered that they had spoken with Ted Hoover at the crime scene of Ali's death many years ago, although he did not seem suspicious at the time. The police had questioned him in connection with Ali's case, but were unable to achieve the desired breakthrough. The investigators had no choice but to secure a warrant for the compulsory collection of Ted Hoover's DNA. On March 24, 2004, armed with a warrant, they returned to Ted Hoover's residence, only to find the house empty. The man had fled. Ted Hoover was officially declared wanted on suspicion of Ali Kemp's murder. During the search, Roger continued to play an active role. He returned to the proven method of publishing posters on billboards across neighboring states. He purchased over 500 billboard advertisements. Ted Hoover's face was displayed in Colorado, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, Iowa, and Nebraska. To fund such a massive manhunt, Roger Kemp had to spend all his savings and even sell the home his family had lived in for over 20 years, as the entire billboard campaign now cost over $100,000. And it was not in vain. In August 2004, the police received a tip from Missouri that someone recognized the person from the billboard. However, the tip mentioned that this individual was now living not under the name Ted Hoover, but as Benjamin Appleby. The police went to the address provided in the tip, and indeed, they found the man known to them as Ted Hoover. He was arrested on the spot on suspicion of murder. The police legally obtained a saliva sample from him. Their suspicions were confirmed when the DNA of Benjamin Appleby, a.k.a. Ted Hoover, matched the DNA found at the crime scene. Benjamin had several prior run-ins with the law, ranging from robbery to intimate offenses. The police in Connecticut arrested him on an earlier warrant charging him with indecent exposure. When questioned about Ali's murder, he confessed to the police that he approached the girl he liked to flirt with her, but she did not reciprocate. When he tried to touch her, she pushed him away, causing Benjamin to lose control and assault her. Later, Benjamin was charged with murder and attempted assault. He was found guilty on both counts. I strangled her, I guess. I don't know why the hell I did it, said Benjamin Appleby in a recorded interview. According to Appleby, he touched her. Not strongly, he said. And when she resisted, he began to strangle and beat the 19-year-old girl. 
Then the detectives learned the horrifying reason why the antiseptic ointment was open. Appleby tried to assault Ali when she lost consciousness and he needed lubrication. In his defense, Benjamin Appleby said that he simply snapped, headed back to his car, and drove away. On December 10, 2005, on the final day of the trial against Benjamin Appleby, a.k.a. Ted Hoover, he was sentenced to 50 years in prison. He was found guilty under Kansas law, 50 years in prison with no chance for parole until 2054. However, Benjamin Appleby, who has been serving his sentence for several years now, has expressed doubts about the fairness of his sentence under the Kansas Hard 50 law. He argued that since the factors that led to his Hard 50 were determined by a judge, not a jury, as required by a previous U.S. Supreme Court ruling, Kansas law automatically required that his sentence be modified. Prosecutors contend that the state law does not apply to Benjamin Appleby's case and that the Hard 50 should remain in effect. Roger Kemp warned the public that reducing the prison term for Benjamin Appleby would put other young women and girls at risk. This marked the end of Roger Kemp's struggle and his pursuit of the man who ended his daughter's life. His relentless determination to see Ali's assailant face justice led to a rather unusual idea. He wanted to use highway billboards so that every passerby could see the composite sketch. Roger Kemp's inventive idea of using billboards to reach more people proved very successful. Several states across the country decided to adopt similar measures with high success rates. After Benjamin Appleby's conviction, Roger Kemp founded the Ali Kemp Educational Foundation, named Take Defense. It offers self-defense training to girls and young women aged 12 to 23. Workshops are conducted nationwide. Participants have sent hundreds of testimonials from women saying that the training prevented attacks and even saved their lives. Until his last days, Kemp personally spoke at events and before each local class. Over 70,000 people across the country have taken this self-defense course. Later, he started a self-defense program for girls and women of all ages, named the Ali Kemp Educational Foundation, or simply TAKE, it teaches women how to protect themselves in dangerous situations. In 2011, Roger Kemp was also awarded the Presidential Citizens Medal for his work with the foundation. Out of 6,000 nominees, Kemp was one of 13 people to receive one of the highest honors a civilian can receive from the president. He believed his daughter would still be alive if she had known how to defend herself and, as a result, hoped to teach other women to do the same. Years after the tragic loss of his only beloved daughter, he still could not bear to describe the brutal assault on her and did not wish to recall that horrific day that completely changed his life. He ended her life because he attempted to attack her and it's very hard for me to say assault her. He ended her life and then tried to assault her again, said Roger Kemp in an interview. Friends and acquaintances who took an active part in the search for Alexandra Kemp's assailant have become a close-knit family who still remember and mourn her sudden and unjust demise. Tireless, passionate, and kind, Roger Kemp passed away at the age of 77. He truly was a national treasure, said Jill Leaker, his friend and colleague. Roger Kemp's ingenuity helped hundreds of people find justice. Inspired by Kemp's idea, many other police departments across the country have adopted similar billboard strategies to date, these billboards have helped authorities in Kansas alone capture more than 30 fugitives. Once, on a popular TV show, Roger Kemp said, You have two choices. You can stay in bed and pull the covers over your head, or you can get out and fight the battle. I chose to fight. I would never let this guy win. And he kept his word. By his efforts, he protected the community from a brutal criminal who surely would have repeated his actions honor and praise to such a devoted, loving father and truly strong individual. Thanks for watching guys, subscribe to my channel, there are many shocking stories ahead of you.